Hey everybody, Steve here again from Option Alpha, and today I am super excited to have Jack Andrews, co-founder of Unabated, to come on here and chat with us a little bit about the world of sports betting uh, and how we can really draw quite a few parallels between options trading, sports betting, uh, Unabated really takes a very similar approach to Option Alpha as far as reviewing and looking at how we can assess potential trades, potential bets. And so I'm looking forward to having a fun conversation with Jack. Jack, I appreciate you coming on. Oh, well, my pleasure, Steve. Uh, thanks for the invite. Yeah, so I have been a professional gambler for over 20 years. Uh, I started out with blackjack, card counting, the gateway drug of all advantage gambling. And uh, I did that for a few years. But I was always thinking, like, what comes next? There's got to be something more. And, you know, I would see, I'd talk to other fellow card counters, and they'd say, oh, well, I'm doing whole carding now where you uh you know you can maybe see the the dealer's whole card and get an edge that way completely legal by the way and others were doing shuffle tracking <clears throat> excuse me where they could uh maybe track the shuffle through you know at, at a casino and uh, if there was a, a block of high cards that had clustered together in the in the shoe they could track that through the shuffle and know when to bet big so everything in advantage gambling kind of leads to something else there's always a it's always a stepping stone to something else. And that's what I loved about it. I loved always finding out something new, some new arrow to put in my quiver, some new weapon to use against the casinos. And this went on and on and on. Uh, I got started with internet casinos in the early 2000s, right? At the start of my career. And that was a huge boost because they offered these sign-up promotions, much like the ones that are out there now, the online sports books. Uh, they were even better back 20 years ago. And I was able to build a bankroll and I was able to kind of look into what was coming next for me. And eventually all roads led to sports betting because sports betting probably has the highest ceiling of any uh, gambling pursuit. <clears throat> In fact, I would say like the financial markets are a much higher ceiling, uh, but a much more efficient market. But the sports betting markets is kind of the pinnacle of uh, advantage gambling. And so I got started in that. That's been a long road. Uh, and then when New Jersey, I live in New Jersey, by the way, uh, when New Jersey started to talk about legalizing sports betting, I was like, well, this is my chance. This is, I will just, you know, I'll have, there'll be a sports book on every corner. And this is 2011, so no one's even thinking mobile. And that fight took about eight years to pass through all the court systems. And when it finally, uh, PASPA, which is the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act, uh, was struck down by the Supreme Court in 2018, New Jersey was allowed to put out regulated sports betting, and it was all basically on apps. And I was like, man, this is, this is my chance. Uh, and Steve, what I found out real quick was that they were going to start limiting people that were too sharp to win. So in other words, if you were a winning better, you we're now had a $5 limit at DraftKings and a $2 limit at FanDuel uh, and so on. And unfortunately that had to kind of uh, make me pivot to what do I do next? What comes next? And on the road to what comes next, I came up with the idea of, well, why don't I create some tools and resources for sports bettors to get edges that they might not be able to get? In other words, what is the value of a half point in an NFL football game? Uh, you know, how much should this be priced at if the efficient market makers are all priced at this number and you can find an outlier price? Uh, what's the benefit of that? So that's what led to creating unabated.com with a couple other people. And I, I guess that gets us caught up in the last 20 years to where I am now. Just so that people understand better, you use the term advantage gambling a lot. Um, what, what exactly does that mean from, from your standpoint? And I'm just curious, I think there's a lot of people that maybe haven't heard that term, um, expand on what that means. Sure. Advantage gambling is using legal means to beat games of chance and some games of skill as well as I consider sports betting to be like poker. It's, it's partly a game of skill. And so you're using whatever means you have that are legal to do so. So for instance, I mentioned hole carding which uh, suppose you have a, a sloppy blackjack dealer and this dealer, as they, as they deal the cards out, they're, they're flashing the bottom card to the whole table as they put it down. Trust me, this has happened. Yeah. Well, now you have 
more knowledge, right? You have the knowledge of the dealer's face card that's showing you the up card as well as the down card. And so you know that they have a 17 right now and you have a 15 and you know you need to hit because you know, you're know you not gonna win this hand. Um, that's one of the things you can do. Um, and that's completely legal. And there are plenty of other, the thing I like to tell people, Steve, is that every game in a casino can be beat with the right conditions. So people always say to me, well, what about roulette? You can't beat roulette. Roulette is a very tough game to beat. It's got a 5% house edge, but suppose there was a biased wheel or suppose there was a dealer that always spun the ball the exact same velocity from the exact same point on the track and it's going to do five rotations and drop at the same point each time. You just need to know where the wheel is going to be at that point for the, the their expected point drop. That's not something that happens all the time. I could probably live to be 100 and never get an edge doing that. Mm -hmm. But theoretically, that has an edge. Um, slot machines, you know, and this is something that, you know, 20 years ago, people are like, there's no way to beat slot machines. Well, now these slot machines have these bonus states where uh, you, you know, you, you build up something on screen and it's going to cash out a big bonus. So like, in other words, like 100 coins. Uh, and, it, and it's going to tip over when it gets to 100 and it's at 99 coins. Well, you know that that has a positive expectation. The next time it accrues a coin, it's going to dump out all 100 coins. But suppose somebody, you know, a mindless person playing the slot machine walks away from it when it has 96 coins built up. Well, now you have a positive EV situation in a slot machine. And there are tons of slot machines like this. And there's a, an entire subculture of advantage players that just wait in casinos and look for these machines and pick up, you know, uh, a couple dollars here, a couple dollars there. And trust me, they make six figures a year doing this. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, economy of scale. There's so many slot machines that have these edges that they can make a lot of money just roaming around. I can't imagine it's good for their health being in casinos that much. I can't stand to be in casinos yeah. that much anymore. But get back to your original question. Yes, advantage gambling, uh, the definition would be using legal means to get an edge at games of chance or skill. Interesting, interesting. You brought up a, a great term that um, any traders here at Option Alpha will recognize, which is positive expected value, which is something that we've really put a lot of effort into shining a light on over the last uh, year, really, and really how we've molded our approach to options trading 2.0, which is using math, using probabilities, using data. I wanted to touch a little bit too on before, before we came on, we spoke a little bit and I had asked you about your background in, in financial markets. You know, before you came to this, how much did you trade? Were you interested in options? Were you interested in just stock trading? And how that sort of segued into saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus more in this area where, and the reasons why, you know, was it the low hanging fruit? Was it more exploitable edges? Was it less of an efficient market, as you mentioned? Um, so if you don't mind spending a couple minutes on that, I'd love to hear your, your background there as well, please. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm kind of a paradox because I'm very risk averse in my investing strategy. Uh, I gamble millions of dollars a month and I'm very risk averse when it comes to my investments. Uh, they're basically all in index funds. Uh, now, I do understand options trading. I did look into it for myself about, about 20 years ago. Uh, there's a, there is a famous blackjack author named Don Schlesinger, who was the head of options trading education at Morgan Stanley back when it was Morgan Stanley. And so he would sometimes cross over within the blackjack community and say, okay, well, here's, here's some advice on options trading. And I still remember that, you know, the biggest thing he would say is, you know, you always want to be selling, you never want to be buying. And when you're selling, you never want to walk away from your desk, you are always, uh, you know, always committed to the price that you have out there, because the, the market can swing against you. Um, and so I looked at, you know, if, hey, if Don says that, you know, options trading is where it's at, then I'm going to go look at it. And I did. But back in that time, Steve, I probably had a bankroll that was less than $100,000. Um, I probably only committed to maybe $20,000 to play with it. Um, I probably used it more as a, you know, oh, okay, I, I can gamble with an edge here. Uh, and I probably didn't have an edge. Um, and back then, there wasn't a lot of tools. But it was, in the end, it was the money I could make in casinos was a lot more. Um, 
you know, especially back when I had those first wave of internet casinos, uh, it was, you know, two, three thousand dollars a day is what you could profit from these casinos risk free. Um, it's not like anything like it is today. And it was glorious. Now they would stiff you a lot. You would, there's a lot of ones that never paid me, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, overall the edge was enough there. And I kind of built up my bankroll that way. And, uh, I always look, Steve, I'm always looking for the least amount of work to do. <laughs> right. So I, I would prefer to say, okay, I know I can get this edge betting on NBA player props than trying to create this model to beat NBA sides. You know, like it's much easier to narrow your focus down to just player prop, just this person, just this center, mm -hmm. rather than try to figure out the whole team and you know all the dynamics that would go into modeling the entire team. You, because I know you have said that you kind of came about it the opposite way. You went from sports betting into options trading. And so I guess my question to you is um, what, what was that slippery slope that led you right in? Cause I would think, Oh man, the financial markets, that's tougher to beat. What made you feel like, no, this is, this is the area I want to get involved in. That, you know, that's a good question. It, for me, sports was always my background. I love sports. I grew up playing sports. Um, you know, my first foray into that world was was really fantasy. And we're talking 20 years ago, me and my three roommates sitting in the living room, literally counting up the stats in the newspaper <laughs> to to go back to the early days of that. And, you know, I just I, I love sports. But really, the turning point for me was, I would say, about seven or eight years ago um, when daily fantasy football came out. And that was a big sort of shift in the industry there. You had these apps that were out all of a sudden you could get in there. You had this access on a much more consistent basis of, oh, I'm playing my 10 buddies, you know, that I went to high school and middle school with. And we've been in this league forever and, you know, put a couple hundred bucks in and it's four months and you, you get a, you know, a small ROI. And if you factor that into the time you put into it, it, it doesn't even make sense if we're being honest, but it was more of just to do it and be fun. Um, but when Daily Fantasy came out, I was like, you know, at that point, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know anything about the stock market. But as I started to sort of do some research into daily fantasy and say, you know what, I think there's something here where we can approach this with a little bit of structure and actually do this intelligently. And there was a couple of books that came out that I read um, and they were written by guys that used to be um, hedge fund traders. You know, they were prop, they were prop traders or hedge fund traders. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. They were full time traders. And as you well know, I, I feel like there's a, a three part Venn diagram, which is the world of sports betting and fantasy trading options and um, casino games, right? Blackjack. A lot of these guys were blackjack or poker players at a professional mm -hmm. level. And they were probably doing all of it at the same time. And that's because they had a certain mindset and they approached it a certain way, which was it's math, it's numbers. We can do this the right way. We can leverage some of these edges. And if we're smart, responsible with our bankroll and how we manage our risk, then over the long run, this is something that if we stick with it and we're consistent, there's something to it. So as I read these books, I was like, OK, you know, I understand this side of it, which is football. Um, but here's all these concepts that the people are starting to throw my way, which I hadn't really I hadn't really used the way to approach it as far as looking at a portfolio, looking at a bankroll, what are my unit sizes? How much do I want to risk per? And if I'm starting to get into my odds, my probabilities, my reward to risk, okay, what's my risk of ruin? If I'm if I'm making, you know, five percent of my bankroll per bet and I'm and I'm doing this and am I wanted, you know, do I want to be betting on these giant sort of large pool games where the winner brings home a hundred thousand dollars but only 10% of people get paid out? Or do I want to do these smaller games where the probabilities come in my favor, but the payout's a little bit smaller? And he, he, you know, these authors sort of related it to the financial markets. And so I'm like, well, you know what? I understand football. Uh, I, you know, I understand golf for the most part. As I got older, I got away from baseball and basketball. So there's basically this eight months a year where I wasn't really interacting with it. But here's this options market, which is going on five days a week, 365, you know, 52 weeks a year. Um, and I really like this approach to it, right? Maybe there's more to it. And so um, ironically, I, I found Option Alpha before I joined the team. 
And to your point earlier, what I really like that you guys do is you have that education tab up there, right? Mm -hmm. There's a way to educate people and to go about it and to learn things the right way. And so I, I dove into it head first, fell in love with it. Um, and I've just been chugging away at it ever since then and trying to find ways to optimize it. Sports betting side of it, I still do for, you know, for fun. Um, there was probably two or three years there where I really tracked it, you know, and was really into it with, with spreadsheets and tracking things like that. And again, I started to look at how we're providing tools for retail traders. You're providing these tools for, for the retail sports betting community to help find an edge. And, you know, now when I explain it to my friends, I have a lot of friends that understand sports, but like me, didn't understand anything about trading. And I could always use sports as an analogy, right? Hey, if you want to bet on the favorite, you have a higher percentage of winning that bet. You're not going to get paid out as much as if you took the underdog, right? So let's start talking about these things like reward to risk versus ROI versus edge. I can, I can place these trades. I can stack these high probability trades. And if I do it consistently over a long period of time, I know what my expectancy is. Then it just becomes on me to managing my emotions, managing my risk management, my bankroll. And I think it's, so many crossovers between the two worlds, which is why I was really looking forward to this conversation to sit down and talk with somebody who is a professional in that world to see how you approach it. And I'd love to sort of steer the conversation that way now of, mm -hmm. of some of those key terms that I just saw peppered all over sports betting and options trading, which was bankroll management, you know, risk of ruin, evaluating probabilities versus reward to risk versus payout. And how, and how you approach that, you know, on your day to day, you say you're risking millions of dollars a month, a year. Um, how do you, how do you construct that portfolio from a sports betting standpoint? And I'm curious what those parallels are to the options trading world. Yeah. I mean, it all comes down to EV expected value. So everything I'm doing, I am assigning an EV number two. And if it's not a positive number, then I don't want to bet it. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny, <laughs> Steve, because it's very easy to be undisciplined in any gambling pursuit. But for some reason, I am wired in a way that I, there's nothing I would enjoy less than making a negative EV sports bet. You know, sit me down at a game at a bar somewhere and somebody goes, oh, let's put money on this. No, like I would rather, I'd rather just light a $20 bill on fire than bet $20 on a on a game or a side that I don't have an edge at. However, if I could identify that I had a 0.1% edge on one side of that bet, then yeah, sure. I'll bet $20 on it. Yeah, no problem. Um, it, it's just, it's just the way I'm wired. And I think for a lot of people, it comes down to how do you approach sports betting? Do you approach it qualitatively or quantitatively? I'm a quantitative guy. I know a lot of people that, when they're looking to make a sports bet, they're going, Celtics are the better team. That's who I'm going to bet on. Or uh, the Celtics are the better team because I saw the way they played last week and they're playing good. Or the Celtics are the better team because they've been playing lousy and now they're due to play good. They make these just narratives. They make all of these qualitative narratives. And you probably see it a lot in financial markets. People just make opinions about a stock that they think is going to move in one, this direction because of nothing quantitative, just because of their, I just know that, you know, this is the week that Apple soars, that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, the other side of that is quantitative. And that's where I live. That's where a lot of the advantage players that I know live. And basically they're creating some kind of quantitative model to quantify their edge. For instance, they say, oh, look, these sharp books have Celtics minus three and a half, and I can get Celtics minus three, half a point better. Is that worth betting? Now, you got to factor in the VIG in sports betting, the minus 110 that you see at the end of the line there. Um, so you got to say, is that's, that's about four and a half percent house edge there. Is getting a half point worth four and a half percent in order for me to have an edge? That's where unabated comes in. We have the tools to quantify the difference between minus three and a half and minus three. That actually wouldn't be an edge. But if you get minus two and a half on the Celtics uh, at minus 110, you're getting a full point better than what the sharp books have, the, the market makers. Well, now you have 
probably about a 2.3% edge on that bet. Great, 2.3% edge. If you're using some sort of uh, Kelly staking with a Kelly criterion, and you could say, okay, well, if I have a 2.3% edge, I am going to bet, Kelly would say, 2.3% of my bankroll adjusted for the minus 110 odds. So it'd be about 2.5% of your bankroll. However, with sports betting, yes, you can quantify your edge, but that does not mean that it's a dealt from a 52 card deck and the, the physics of the universe are, are finite. You need to realize that things can happen. A player can go down with injury. Uh, the Boston Celtics can just, you know, blank the bed, right? They're, they, a lot of things can happen. So yeah. you need to adjust for the risk of anything can happen. And what, you know, John Kelly back in 1929 or whatever, when he created the Kelly Criterion, wasn't thinking about bankroll management. He was thinking about new uh, signal strength through a telegraph line. But what they do is they came up with a fractional Kelly. So if you have, if you're not able to fully quantify the exact amount of your expectation, you basically uh, divide by two or four or eight, however you want to do. So personally, I tell people bet quarter Kelly. So you'd bet one fourth of what the Kelly stake would be. That would probably be what about 0.65% of your bankroll. Um, for a lot of people doing all that math of like saying, okay, well, you know, if I have a two and a half percent edge and I need to bet this and that it's too much. And so for those people, I just say, just flat stake, you know, bet 1% of your bankroll or anytime you find an edge, that sort of thing. Um, but for a lot of people like that, you know, that the point I want to make Steve though, is bankroll management is, is never the reason that you fail at sports betting. Um, if you overbet your bankroll, you can go broke. If you underbet your bankroll, you grow more slowly, assuming you're making positive EV bets. So if you know you're making positive EV bets and you're overbetting your bankroll, you could still go broke. You could be betting too much relative to your edge. But if you underbet your bankroll, in other words, if you're using a fractional Kelly approach or um, you know, you're, you're, you're flat staking at a lower amount than what would normally be your, your Kelly bet, then you're just gonna grow your bankroll more slowly. So that's why I always tell people when they're like, how much should I bet? What should I do? I said, you know, just find whatever number Kelly says you should be betting and divide by four. And there, that way you're in a safe zone the entire time. You're not going to grow it as fast or as optimally, um, but you're also not going to go broke from uh, variant swings. Yeah, that's, that's a great approach. Definitely a lot of crossover there. And to your point, you're, you're going to eliminate a lot of those rash emotional decisions that will stem from overstaking yourself, right? Where you get there, you've overdone it, you lose a couple, which as you said, with positive expectancy and, and high probability, there's always gonna be stretches and runs where things don't go your way. And the job of the trader, the job of the sports better is, is to stay in the game, right? You can't make the next bet if you're not in the game. So that's, that's a great approach to that. I love hearing that from somebody that does it at your level. Um, the same way I love talking to professional traders that do the same type of thing, right? It's, you got to fight till tomorrow. And the only way you can do that is you can never be too enamored with one specific trade, one specific bet. And to look at the long run, right? Um, I'm curious, how many how many bets do you think you make? Um, uh, I, I, is your goal from where you're sitting just to stack as many positive expected value trades as you can? Yes and no. So... Like, I couldn't even give you a number. I, I have no idea because it varies based on the week. Like this week is actually a down week. There's no there's no college basketball games really going on this week. We went from about 300 to 400 college basketball games a week to now down to, well, we've got 63, well, 65 left in the NCAA tournament. You got the NIT, the CBI, the CIT tournaments, the minor league tournaments. Um, but there's really not a lot of games left. And so this is actually a down week and um, basketball starting to ramp down, hockey starting to ramp down, baseball will ramp up, but baseball is just a hell sport to bet on because um, there's 16 games a day, seven days a week, a lot of the time, and it's just too much. Um, but I don't go at it saying to myself, okay, I need to find 10 good bets today. I go at it and say, how much EV can I find today? 
you know, I may take a $300 prop bet because I have a 10% edge. And in my mind, cha-ching, another $30. Um, I may take a $5,000 line on the NBA where I only have a 2% edge. But in my mind, I say, cha-ching, $100. Um, you know, it's, I'm just always trying to increase that EV number. Uh, which is not just in my head. I have spreadsheets that I just track. Uh, this year, I'm actually, Steve, I've been tracking just EV. I'm not even tracking my results. I do have a column that tracks the results, but I keep it hidden because I don't want to be influenced by how things are going. I want to be influenced by always accruing EV. So that's that's how I go about it. In the busy parts of the year, which are basically September through January, February, um, I may have... 50 plus bets in a day, especially on a Saturday when there's a lot going on. Um, in the slow part of the year where June, July, August, I may have nothing for a week. And I love it <laughs> because trust yeah. me, there's when you can get like away from the grind of it, uh, it's so refreshing. So it's not, um, you know, I think one of the advantages you guys have in financial markets is you can turn it off at a certain hour of a day. Yeah. You know, the market's only open certain hours. Yeah, you could probably trade in foreign markets and currency exchanges and things like that if you really wanted to go whole hog. But for the most part, you can turn it off. Sports betting, man, it's so tough to turn off because, you know, there's pregame betting, there's in-game betting, then there's overnight betting. Um, and that's just one sport. And you, you just kind of always have to be constantly engaged with how the market is moving. Yeah. That's interesting. You brought up a couple of key points that, I didn't really touch on earlier when we talked about options and sports trading, which with trading, you, you have the ability to exit, right? If I'm in an options trade, for example, that's 45 days to expiration. Um, I have 45 days to get out of that trade, right? Good, bad, or scratch. Sports betting, obviously you have live betting, you have cash out abilities. I've noticed somewhat amateur approach to it that I, you know, I'm not quite getting the return that I would expect for something. If I, if I take somebody, if I take an underdog to win and I'm in the halfway through the third quarter and they're up 10 points, I'm, I don't feel like I'm getting return on that as I would if you, if you drew that parallel to options trading. Right. So mm -hmm. that was always interesting to me, but it's also on the flip side of that is 45 days versus what three hours, right? I can turn that capital a little bit quicker. Um, even if I'm not quite getting rewarded in quite the same way that I would in options trading. So do you find yourself live betting as much? That's something that fascinates me. And I know, and I know you focus a lot on arbitrage and things like that. And, and do you find yourself doing that? It, but to your point, you have to be extremely involved, right? If you're going to be doing that, if you're taking the bets before the game, maybe the day the line comes out, then right before the game and during the game is, is that how you approach it or are you, are you tracking it that close or do you have something that tells you that, hey, the arbitrage opportunity is there, the positive EV is now there, click the button and go? Yeah, uh, both. Uh, so really in-game betting is almost different than pre-game betting because it's being based on what we have seen during the game and what we know is expected to happen in the game. But it doesn't mean that those two are going to be completely in line the whole way through a game. Um, now, I, per I personally, I don't do a lot of arbitrage stuff, but that has been a very popular thing that people have been doing lately is this concept of live arbitrage where they pick off arbitrage situations that are happening in game, but they're happening for two seconds. Yeah. And you need to be super fast to, in order to get bets down at different sports books. And I think that's one area, Steve, where your audience, uh, one of the things that kind of blows their mind is there's no one brokerage for sports betting. In fact, all the brokerages that are out there have different prices. Exactly. That, you know, that's kind of crazy, right? It's like yeah. you can go to, it's like going to one brokerage and they have strike prices for Google and you go to a different brokerage and they have different strike prices yeah. for Google. Like, how can that happen? But that's what happens in sports betting. And especially when you get into derivative markets, such as alternate lines. So let's say a game's going on. I'll use those Celtics examples from earlier. Uh, the pregame line was Celtics minus three and a half. The Celtics have built up a big lead. The in-game line is Celtics minus eight and a half. But there's also alternate lines of pricing out 
Celtics, nine and a half, 10 and a half, 11 and a half, 12 and a half, all these strike prices. And so if you're watching the game and you're going, man, the Celtics are just going to pull away now. Like, you know, I, I can see their opponent, uh, their star center. Uh, he's, he's looking kind of worn out. They're going to take him out of the game. Celtics are going to pull ahead. I can go ahead and buy in on the Celtics at minus 10 and a half and ride that for a while. Now, what sports betting doesn't have, and you kind of alluded to it, is they don't have the counterparty to cash you out of a bet at a fair number. In fact, the sports book will offer you a cash out, which is typically 50 cents on the dollar. Like, that's horrible. Yeah. Like, that's like the payday loans of yeah. <laughs> sports betting, right? So uh, there are exchanges out there now. Um, I'm in New Jersey. We have Sport Trade here, which is, uh, interestingly, they're backed by Susquehanna International Group famous options traders. Um, and they're willing to put up lines throughout the game at the various strike prices for you to get in and out of a position. And it is very much like options trading when you can watch a game and say, okay, and this is, here's a clear example of something I've done. I'm watching the game. I'm watching a Sixers game. And I see that Paul Reed stands up on the bench. He's Joel Embiid's backup center. He's going to come in if Joel Embiid goes out. If I see him stand up on the bench, I know Joel Embiid is going to come out. So immediately I would bet against the Sixers or I would bet that the the gameplay would slow down because Paul Reed is kind of slow compared to Joel Embiid. And now once he checks into the game, the lines adjust. You know, the sports books are very fast. But the fact that I was able to see him standing up on the bench, I got an extra... 10 seconds lead time. So I was able to get like an extra two points there. And then I do the same thing. Uh, I know they're coming up to a break, maybe the end of the quarter. And I know they're going to put Joel Embiid back in to start the next quarter. So I would go ahead and get out of that position, uh, you know, and maybe, maybe wind up with the middle, maybe just wind up with an arbitrage situation that I've created of playing both sides against each other. Those are the fun things that like, that's where sports betting's going. We're not there yet. DraftKings, FanDuel, BetMGM, Caesar, they're not there yet. They're just in it for the recreational better to, hey, bet your opinion. But we're eventually going to get to a point where people are going to be able to approach it as if they're trading on a contract that expires at the end of the game. I could make a bet at one sports book, a heavy bet, and they know I'm a sharp better, and they go, okay, well, Jack just bet into us. We need to move this line. Where some other sports better, maybe another very well-respected sports better might be betting the other side at another sports book. And they go, well, that's, that's, that's spanky. He's very respected. Let's move the line. And he's betting the other side. And so now they've already created diverging prices. And because they don't know of each other's action and they don't know of a central clearinghouse of seeing the order flow come through, they're going based on their own information. Now they then look at an odd screen like unabated and, all of the sports books now use unabated. They use them all. They use all the major odd screens because they want all the information. And they look at the odd screen. And they go, well, wait a minute. The guys across town just moved the other direction. What, what's going on? You know, and then so they'll look and try to solve that puzzle for their own and adjust their number back. They're all keeping up with the Joneses, right? But the fact that there's no central clearinghouse of all this information means they're all guessing. And when they're all guessing, that creates inefficiency. Now, the market inefficiency is not uniform across all of sports betting. In fact, it's, it's like a spectrum of inefficiency. Um, the most efficient markets right now are NFL football and English Premier League soccer. Those are the world known. Those markets are efficient. If the price is that, it's going to be the price everywhere. That doesn't mean somebody's going to have, you know, Niners minus six and a half and somebody else is going to have Niners minus seven. That still happens. But by the time we get to game time, all of the known information of the world has hammered that price down to as flat as possible. And, you know, the game goes off and, and that efficient line, you know, usually holds up. Um, if you were to take all the games that were played in the NFL this year, 700, 274 games or so, uh, and you were to always bet on the favorite at game time, you would find out it comes out to like you would win 49.8% of the time. Not enough to overcome the VIG, um, betting on the underdog. Not enough to win, betting on the favorite. The, the line was efficient. On Towards the other end of the spectrum are things where we don't have market liquidity. We don't have uh, enough of a uniform set of betting. So let's, let's use a, an esoteric example. Let's say 
that DraftKings Sportsbook is letting you bet on who will win the opening tip off in an NBA game. You know, they tip the ball off. Who's going to win that? Um, first of all, that is a very inefficient market because referees really don't throw that ball with much fairness. Like they just kind of throw it up and, and some, some NBA players say, okay, I'm going to win that tip. Others are like, ah, you take it. We're going to hold back on defense. So it's very, there's a lot of dynamics at play when it comes to just that single bet. Well, let's say they offer that bet and nobody else offers that bet. So now DraftKings, if they take a big bet on that line, they would have to say, well, we can't look at what FanDuel has the line at. We can't look at what Caesars has the line at. We just have to guess, was this person sharp or not? Um, so what they do is they say, they say, well, let's not take a big bet. Maybe they'll do a $100 max on that line. And now you have a market that for a sharp better, it's not worth looking into that for a $100 max bet. And they might limit me even further anyway. So I'm not even going to give you a sharp opinion. So now you just have betters that maybe they're just guys that are like, oh, I'm going to throw that into a parlay. And I think that's in the movie Uncut Gems is he bet on the opening tip off of the game. Um, but they then kind of just create what is a very inefficient market of, of dead money kind of playing in that pool, which is a very small pool of liquidity. It'll never get hammered into shape. We're never going to have a good line there. Um, that's the other end of the spectrum. And then everybody else is in between. So whereas a full NBA game could be pretty sharp, an NBA for, first quarter might not be as sharp or a player prop might not be a sharp or a team prop. And you kind of go down the line and it is a correlation there of the amount of tolerance that a sports book has on a market is in, in, in correlation with the liquidity, high liquidity market, high tolerance, low liquidity market, low tolerance. And the inverse relationship there is how beatable the market is yeah. high tolerance, high liquidity, not beatable. Low tolerance, low liquidity, very beatable. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it all works right now in sports betting. We're inching towards efficiency. In other words, five years ago, I could never dream that there was this many player props available. And there's this many player props because of guys like you, Steve, yeah. who started out in DFS, and now they come into sports betting. They go, I want to put player props. I, I've grown up always betting these you know, fantasy um, point totals. I want to bet that on a sports book. And there's so much demand yeah. that sports books like, okay, we'll keep offering all these player props. And now they're starting to take a lot more money on these player props. And they're like, well, wait a minute, maybe we should have three guys from the trading team just focus on player props and trading them sharply so that we can get an edge on these betters. And now they're starting to be able to take more money at it. And right now in the NFL, you can get a couple thousand dollars down on a player prop later in the week. In the NBA, you can get a thousand or two thousand down on an NBA player prop later in the day. They're not going to take that early in the day when they're still kind of fixing their lines and hammering them into place. But later in the day, they're willing to take that because the market efficiency is finally getting there for player props. Yeah. And that, yeah, I mean, you definitely see that in the financial market now where the derivative markets are, I mean, some would argue they're the one wagging the dog's tail at this point. Right. And there's mm -hmm. a strong, strong sense of that with the options market that, those bets being placed in the options market are indeed driving the underlying price where for decades it was quite the opposite. Right. Um, and, and that's a whole nother topic that people will take different sides of, but it is interesting to see that world in, in both sports betting and in the financial stock markets of derivatives just exploding. Right. Um, very much love a quantitative approach to this. <clears throat> so when I, when I look at options, strategies, markets, things like that, there's a wealth of historical information that I can tap into. I can back test these types of things and see how, you know, maybe the 20 Delta iron condor has played out in this in different market conditions. I can build somewhat of a model. So I'm curious how you're, if you do, and I'm sure you do, and how you do that in the sports betting world um, to, you know, quote unquote, back test these things. All right. Home favorites, three point home favorites in an NFL game. What is their historical? And then, and then does that build into your model of expectancy? I'm curious about that because I've, I've, I've never actually looked that deep into that side of it other than just some very surface level basic stats that anybody can say, oh, yeah, you know, in a dome, it's just, it's you know, mm -hmm. a higher chance of going over. But obviously, to your point, in an efficient market, well, they know that some of these things are starting to play into that. So so what's that back and forth 
and how has that evolved? Yeah, uh, look, there are definitely people that do this approach, that take this approach of saying, okay, I'm going to find all the games you know, that have ever been played in the NFL, which is not hard to do. There's only 270 some played each year. Uh, so you can go 10 years and you will equal the number of games that are played in one Major League Baseball season. Like it's sure. the NFL is small sample size theater. And if you go to college sports, it's even worse because they're only playing nine to 11 games each. And there are so many different college programs and they're turning over the roster all the time. So there comes a point where it's tough to look back on historical information because it's not the same. We're not playing NFL the same way now that we were playing it 10 years ago. It's, it's tough to kind of realize because we watch the NFL. We don't see the change happening instantly, but there has been a shift to more of a passing game than there was 10 years ago. There has been uh, a shift to longer field goal attempts now than there were 10 years ago, things like that. So that does impact historical data. Where I think it's useful to people to understand is sometimes it's better to take a top-down approach than a bottom-up approach. And I find too many people, when they get in, into sports betting, they go, okay, I'm going to make a model. I'm going to beat this. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna reinvent the wheel because that's what they're doing. Somebody else has already done that before. Um, I was making models in the mid-2000s, and I thought I had the most unique angle ever. It was actually based on barometric pressure in baseball, um, which creates a different type of wind resistance. And I was using some aviation tools to right size altimeters in airplanes. And I was corresponding that to the elevations of baseball stadiums and how thin the air could be, not just Colorado, obviously, but in like Atlanta. Um, and, you know, based on temperature and, and barometric pressure, I thought I was the most unique person in the world. And I was winning at it. And then I stopped winning. And for three or four years, I was struggling. I was never really making much of a profit. I'm like, man, I just, you know, I don't know what happened. Well, what happened is other people figured it out. They had read the same books that I had read, which was a book called The Theory of Baseball. Bart Giamatti, the old MLB commissioner back in yeah. the 80s, well, yeah. and Pete Rose. Well, his other major work he did in the one year he was commissioner is he commissioned a study by Yale of the physics of baseball. And they actually put out a, a book called The Physics of Baseball. And it was it's 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 incredible for anyone who likes stats and things like that because it's it still holds true today until they started monkeying with the ball but that's another story. Anyway, the point being is, I had read this book, I had come up with this idea of barometric pressure, how it applies, and created a model. You know who else had done the same thing? A guy that would later be my business partner, Rufus Peabody. That's his real name. Rufus had done the same type of work, and he had created a model. And he had shared his model with a bunch of people. I had shared my model with nobody. Well, what had happened is within a year or two, the market became efficient because everyone started factoring this in. And that's the problem. When you try to find something that's original, an original thought in the world of sports betting, it's very tough to do. And you don't know how original your thought is because backtesting can sometimes be flawed because they played the game differently. You know, like I mentioned, they monkey with the baseballs. Well, they started monkeying with the baseballs. They made the, the seams flatter, which made less air resistance, which made them fly further, it made them less hard to throw curve balls. And so the balls were more hittable. So they're kind of straight balls flying further, home runs boomed. But we didn't know that until after the season that they had changed the baseball. So that's the sort of thing that makes trying to find an original thought in sports betting tough. Uh, that's why I think it's better to do a top-down approach. And what a top-down approach is uses the market efficiency against itself. So in other words, I already described how all these different sports books have all these different numbers, and that makes for inefficiencies in the market. Well, as long as you can identify which set of numbers is the source of truth, then you can identify how far off the outliers are and pick them off. And that's what a lot of people do with sports betting this, these days. They call it the top-down approach. They used to call it the steam-chasing approach. And what this is, is when you see a line move at a market-making book, a book that, you know, they know the sharp action. They know who's who's betting what, where it's going. They're, they're taking their cue from the sharp bettors because they allow them to bet at that place. They move their line and you say, okay, well, this other book over here hasn't moved yet. I'll grab it here. And sure enough, after you grab it, that move line, that, that line moves. And you, you know, you 
you, you get value that way. You get basically an intrinsic value of getting a, a point better on a three-point line. Um, and that's the way a lot of people approach it these days. That's how I thought. Yeah. Like, that's how I thought. I thought I need to find something that nobody else has thought of before. And yeah. then I found there's yeah. nothing new in the world, Steve. Somebody's thought of everything, yeah. right? So yeah. it's it can be really frustrating to try to beat sports that way. Look, I still have angles I don't talk about. I talk about that one because that one's dead. But I have other things that I've kind of, you know, I've, I've worked on over the years and they've proven successful. And eventually the inefficiency gets swallowed up by the market. Yeah, yeah. Just in both, right? Sports betting and financial markets. The, yeah. Speaking of Rufus, I actually was reading one of his articles yesterday and he was talking about looking at expected ROI, looking back at it. Mm -hmm. And um, something I know as traders, we love to do, right? We like to go through the trades. We like to see what the conditions were going into it, evaluating that versus the actual realized PL, the realized expected value. Um, and, and, you know, we can export our data and and look at it and twist it a million different ways until the cows come home. Um, so at, from your perspective, how, you know, I'm curious how much you do that and, and sort of what lens you look at those trades, the idea of, I guess, sort of internalizing those losing trades and having to take that with the grain of salt of process versus execution versus results, right? Going through all of that. Um, yeah, I just, I'd like to hear that from your standpoint, because I know it from the trading standpoint, I know a lot of traders and how they do it and how we do it. Um, and you don't even, you're not even looking at the PL results you said at this point, you're just looking at your expected value, right? Day over day, mm -hmm. month over month. And you're just saying, all right, I stacked EV on top of itself as many, you know, I took these good bets. And then when you go back to look at it, how are you looking at those results? And is that impacting what you do going forward? Um, and sort of what is that timeline, right? Where you, I think that's something that we struggle with as traders as well is you have to give it enough time to make sure it's actually playing out. But at some point, do you need to start to make changes and modify what you're doing? And when do you have that self-reflection of, okay, maybe I wasn't onto something or versus we need to let the probabilities play out. Yeah. So this is one of these situations where it said, do as I say, not as I do, but I'll explain to you why I don't do this. But what I would tell people is you have certain guideposts when it comes to sports betting. One of them is CLV, closing line value. So we know that a market is tending towards efficiency. And the most efficient that a market can be before the game is played is that last minute or two before the game starts. That's the closing line. And you, you go to any odd screen and they'll show you what the closing line is, where the odds stopped, where the all the prediction markets you know, finally gave their prediction, I guess. Uh, and if you can beat that closing line, in other words, you have value uh, based on the bet you made earlier relative where the line closed, you have a good expectation of, of, of positivity, right? And in our case at Unabated, we actually compute EV and CLV the same. So in other words, a lot of sports betting sites would say, oh, your EV is your implied probability that you have for it minus what the sports books implied probability is. Uh, we take it a step further. We divide then by the sports books implied probability because you're, you're betting relative to the sports books probability. You're not just betting in a universal mi one minus the other. And so that's also the way we calculate CLV. So if you make a bet and you have, at the time of bet, you have a 3.2% edge. And when the game goes off, you have a 4.6% edge. Well, that's good because your edge increased. If you're, or that actually that would be bad because you're, uh, it's showing that you you made a bet that got a worse number later. You could you could have got a better number later, is what yeah, it's saying. Yeah. Whereas the converse of that, if the CLV number had dropped and you you know by the time you bet it was there was no um, there was no uh, edge to be found. Well, that's good because you locked in your your edge earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm conflating that because I'm trying to talk about two yeah, multiple fair. different numbers and abbreviations. I apologize. The point I'm making is that's the best way that a aspirational better can track if they're on the right track. Better than results is, is knowing that you had closing line value. Now, there are some sharp betters out there that'll say, well, you actually, you don't want closing line value because the sports book's going to see closing line value. And optimally, you want to have an edge without having closing line value. That's getting too far into the weeds. All you need to know is 
if you had an edge against the closing line, then you're in good company. You will make money in the long run. Um, now, I don't do those analysis for myself simply because I'm making so many bets and I've been doing this long enough. I know I have an edge. I'm not concerned that I don't have an edge. There are very few things that I bet these days where I'm like, maybe I have an edge, maybe I don't, but I'm still going to bet it anyway. No, I've kind of proven it either through empirical data or through knowing that theoretically this has an edge, you know, even if I run bad for a while. And so that's the way I approach it, Steve. And, you know, it's also one of the reasons I don't do a lot of Kelly criterion in my head because I've reached a point where I'm betting enough that I know I'm not going to be able to overbet my bankroll. I'm usually running into sportsbook limits more than I am running into bankroll limitations. Um, but that's also not how I expect other people to do it because other people are still on their journey. They're still on their path to becoming a sharper better. And those are the types of steps you can do calculating CLV, making sure that you're uh, not overbetting your bankroll. Those are the steps that'll help you get to the point of your journey where you don't even have to think about stuff like that anymore. Fantastic. Yep. That's as always another huge parallel, right? To between the two markets of on that journey, learning those, those types of things as you go through it. We've actually done a lot of research. You know, we put out a lot of data on that, looking at for trading what it is, very similar to the closing line value. When you enter a trade, what was the expected value? What was the expected um, return on risk? Alpha, we call it here based on the EV. And what was the actual realized for that? You know, And then we did a study also, well, when do you actually start to see that materialize? And based on the data we, we looked at, it was roughly around a thousand trades, right? So it's important for people to remember that you have to stick with this and as you stick with it, you have to continue to approach it with consistency, right? And I, I think that's the hardest part as us as human beings is continuing to stay out of our own way, to stay disciplined, to stay emotionless and and place these high probability bets, these high probability trades using the data and math and probabilities that we have in front of us. Um, so it's fascinating to see that because we've actually done a very similar thing. And that to me was very eye opening. We also did one with how probabilities play out through the trade, which is a little bit different than sports betting, but kind of the same thing. If if I take a trade today and it's 70%, and if I look at that exact same trade next week and now it's 55%, well, how much do those actually realize what the, to your point, closing line value, the at trade entry probabilities were? And um, I think it's a great practice for both traders and obviously sports bettors as well to to compare those two things. I think we both look at it through that same lens of using the data, quantitative math, and, and using that to guide our decisions, which is why I was really looking forward to have you on on this conversation because I know you approach it sort of the same way that we do. So it, it was great to hear that from you. I, I love it. I mean, personally, um, I've wanted to have this conversation with someone like you for a long time, not only because of my own journey, but I think there's so many traders that can learn some lessons from the sports betting. And I think there's so many people that sports bet. Mm -hmm. And I think both sides of that, I hope through this conversation kind of have that aha moment of like, you know what, there's so many crossovers. And when you get down to it, we're just, we all want to make money and we all want to do it, um, you know, with high probability expected value types of things. And if I told you, if I blindfolded you and I blindfolded me and I said, this is a high expected, whatever it is, whether it's a, options trade or a prop bet in the NBA. And I didn't even tell you what it was. And I said, Hey, if you did this enough times, you're going to make this amount of money off of it. I think you'd probably do it. So I love that you guys are offering those tools in the sports betting world. Um, and we're hoping to do the same for options traders. Yeah. You know, I will say Steve that I've known quite a few options traders over the year years, and they always get it when it comes to sports betting. So if there's anyone out there that's listening and saying, Oh, I don't know if, you know, sports betting, this would trust me, you're going to get it. You're going to get it better than people that are huge sports fans. And that's the other thing. You don't need to be a sports fan to be a sports better. I do not watch a whole lot of sporting events. Uh, I don't know the players on the teams for the most part. I kind of use some examples in our conversations here and I was quickly trying to think of players names <laughs> that I knew. Um, you don't need to be a sports fan. You need to kind of be a, a, a probability fan, you know, you need to understand probability, basic probability. You need to understand um, 
EV and, and calculations like that. That's kind of all it takes. And uh, it, there's really a lot out there and it's an ever expanding world. Um, and that's one of the reasons we started Unabated is because we knew this is going to take off. People are going to enjoy doing this. And there's, yeah, there's going to be recreational bettors that just want to make lottery tickets. They just want to make these long parlays and put up $5 and maybe they'll win a thousand. Um, and that's fine. There's a whole a lot of people out there. There's a lot of people approaching investing like that. Yeah. They just want to put money on their favorite company, you know, Apple or Google or whatever. And uh, that's good. That's dead money in the whole pool, right? That, that, you know, we all take advantage of as, um, you know, aspirational investors. Well, aspirational betters are the same way. They've looked at this and they say, you know what? I don't want to lose money at this. I want to find a way to win. I want to find a way to at least break even or lose less. And that's why we created Unabated is because we have a lot of tools that will help people kind of get to a level they didn't, they wouldn't be able to get to on their own. Solving some of the math that maybe is beyond them. Um, you know, we have some season simulators for the NFL. You know, you put in your power ratings and we'll simulate up the season 10,000 times. And we'll say, you, you know, according to these power ratings, these are the odds that this team is going to win the Super Bowl or win the division or make the playoffs. Um, we have a lot of tools around some, you know, those of you who are in maybe in states where you don't have full legal sports betting, but you do have what's called DFS Pick'em, Prize Picks, Underdog, uh, DraftKings Pick Six. We have tools created for that because that's a whole subset of sports betting right now that's getting very popular. It's sort of like creating parlays of player props, and they have fixed payouts, which sometimes are good and sometimes are bad. And we've got some tools to kind of figure out when when those payouts are good and when they're bad. And uh, we're always kind of expanding. We're always kind of like a little bit of a, you know, Rufus's brain is just constantly working. And he's always coming up with some new ideas like that. You mentioned XROI, which he put out in an article recently. We're going to incorporate that into a bet tracking tool so that you'll be able to track your bets and see your EV, your CLV and your XROI, which is sort of like, you know, how far wrong or right were you in yeah. that prediction um, and track it that way. And, Things like that. We're always looking to make it a little bit better for the sports betters, give them a little bit leg up. We don't sell picks. That's the one thing I want to make clear of this. We we don't have picks. If you're looking for the easy button, we're not it. We're the sandbox that you can build these incredible sandcastles in um, and then tear them down and, and build something else. Um, we're like a box of Legos. That's how, That's kind of our approach to it all. We want to be the tool you use to be a better sports better. We don't want to say, hey, Go bet the Celtics at minus three right now. Um, you can use our tools to identify when Celtics minus three is an advantage play for you, but we're not the kind of like, uh, you know, we think the Celtics are going to do good tonight because they were lousy last night. That's not our bag. Exactly the same. And everybody in our option alpha community can relate to that. You know, we're not here to tell you what to do. We're here to give you the tools and the data um, to help inform those decisions. I, I love what you said about, these, I think there's such a similar archetype to a lot of traders and, and sports bettors. Um, and, and you kind of talked about touching on these parlays, right? When, when we look in, on the Twitter world or in the news, we always see the guy that bet $5 and won 150 grand. We mm -hmm. hear about the people who became rich um, on the GME call options craze, right? And I think mm -hmm. what we see in a lot, and, and I mean, you read books like Market Wizards, and I don't care how how good you are or bad you are or where you started. A lot of people in both did the same thing, right? They're interested. They come in. They sometimes are better or worse. They, they're right out of the gate, right? They, they get a little bit of return on, on what they bet. And then they go, oh, okay, well, this is, this is pretty easy. I can keep doing this, right? And then, unfortunately, a lot of them come back down to earth. And that's where a lot of traders and gamblers have to make a decision. Do they want to educate themselves? Do they want to take this approach of, I can I can continue doing the ten leg parlays and maybe if I'm lucky I break even in the long run or I can start to actually approach the same with options. I can buy these lotto tickets as you as you very correctly placed it, um, or I can take a, a much higher probability approach to this if I want to stick with it for the long run. Um, and yeah, like you said, when I explain this to friends, it's more the other way. I can explain to my my friends that that understand sports. Um, options trading very easily. And I can explain to the people that options trade that, that aren't really sports betters the exact same thing and they understand. And I, I don't go looking for a stock. I don't go looking for this or that. I look for 
trades that if I make this bet over and over and over again, it's going to pay out. I don't care if it's Apple or if it's Tesla or if it's the S&P 500 or, you know, a bond ETF, whatever it is, I'm going to go find the trades that give me the best chance of returning that capital. So it is fascinating to see that, like you said, that um, you can explain it to people. And, and a lot of, a lot of them will get that aha moment. Sometimes they have to find that journey on their own, as you said, but um, it, it's, it's great to have these tools out there on both sides. It's awesome what you guys are doing. Uh, it's been fun tracking it. Um, and I appreciate you coming up and spending the time and talking with me. This was fun. I love talking sports. I love talking options. So I feel lucky and humbled to be able to do that with you today. My pleasure, Steve. Uh, and I'll, you know, anytime you want me back, we we'll tons more we can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think, I feel like we just scratched the surface. I hope to hope to stay in contact. Thank you. You too.